Um, Ms. Sue Donizer is the expert lead and responsible for the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service, CLMS, within Europe for the European Environment Agency. She has two master's degrees, one on geoinformation science and one on law and political science. She will speak on Copernicus Land Monitoring Service, its free data sets and dashboards used by the world on climate, land, water, and marine. Then we will have Mr. Simon Mswingye. He's a land tenure specialist at the United Nations UN Habitat, supporting Ugandan land country operations. He is a valuer with a land management master's. He will talk on customary tenure and local forms of land certificates within the National Land Administration System, linked to natural resource certificates for access to wetlands. Mr. Nelson Nieto is an environmental engineer specialized, specializing in GIS and climate change. He is a researcher in the field of Earth Observation Technologies of the Research and Prospective Directorate of the Geographic Institute, Augustin Codesi of Colombia. He will present on a study of the mangrove forest with earth observation hypersectoral field data and satellite images for a better understanding of this strategic ecosystem and its relationship with ethnic communities of the Colombian Pacific region. Thank you. And we will start immediately with you, Asur. You have 20 minutes plus video. Thank you very much, Harrison, for the introduction. I will share my screen now. Please let me know if I'm doing it correctly, just in case. Okay. Uh, it's in present view at the moment. Yeah. Now it should be okay. This is perfect. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much. So as Clarissa said, I am, uh, my name is Ushuela Nezarroyos. I work for the European Environment Agency in Copenhagen. Um, and I am the project lead for Copernicus at the European Environment Agency. Well, this is first an index on, on what I am going to present. I will give a short introduction to what Copernicus is. Then I will focus on the service I am uh, managing. I will give a, an, uh, an overview of the access to data, uh, some present some use cases, and then uh, give an overview of the planned evolution of the service. Well, first, what is Copernicus? Uh, I, maybe you already know all this, but I, it's always good to go back uh, and, and think about it sometimes or review, uh, remind it. The Copernicus is the Earth Observation component of the European Union's space program. It's looking at our planet and its environment, and it's meant to benefit all European citizens, but also since it's a uh, its uh, scale is global. It is also meant to um, benefit all uh, citizens in the world. It offers information services, not only that come uh, from satellite to uh, derive information from the satellites. It is implemented by member states, the European Space Agency, uh, the European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites, a European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, EU agencies, such as the one I am working for, the European Environment Agency, the Joint Research Center, and Mercator Ocean International. And this is, um, this is a schema of what Copernicus actually is, because I think uh, I, I made up this, this slide some time ago, and I'm still using it every now and then, uh, because I think it's very... Um, it shows in a very intuitive way what we are doing. So we have uh, it, we have on the Earth, we have the in situ component, which is also managed by the European Environment Agency, and it's giving access to in situ data to other Copernicus services. And this is only for the European part. And then we have the satellites above in the space, which are uh, looking at us from the space, with the Sentinels, and this is managed by the European Space Agency. And then we have what we call the monitoring component, which are the six, the currently the six services that are uh, that are available and that are working. We have the three uh, services that we call the environmental services, atmosphere, land, and marine. And then we have um, 
The other ones, we have the emergency management service, we have the security as well, and we have the climate change. And the difference between them is that climate change, emergency, and security are actually users of the data created by the atmosphere, land, and marine. The Copernicus Land Monitoring Service is managed by two different entrusted entities. It's managed by the European Environment Agency for all the data created within Europe and by the Joint Research Center for the data created at global level. You can uh, learn more about this in the, in the web, which is www.copernicus.eu. So within the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service, what we do is we create geographical information on land cover and its changes, on land use, on the vegetation status, water cycle, and the Earth's surface energy variables on European, both on European and global level. The data we are producing is harmonized and consistent in time and space. This is one of the biggest added values of our products is that it is the same information for the whole area. So the differences between countries disappear. All the products are on manuals are free and open. I will come to this afterwards. And as I said before, it's implemented uh, between the Joint Research Center and the European Environment Agency. We are basically working in these six uh, areas of work that you can see on the left part of the slide. Land cover and land use mapping, priority area monitoring, biogeophysical parameters, ground motion monitoring, reference and validation data, and satellite data. And I will come back, I will now present, give a very short introduction on what this means. Once you enter the Copernicus uh, Land Monitoring Service portal, you will show you will see these six areas of uh, of work. You will see the land cover and land use mapping both for global and Europe. The priority area monitoring. This is a priority area monitoring. While the, while the land cover and land use mapping and um, satellite data are created for the whole territory, for the whole area of interest, priority area monitoring is focusing on specific areas of the terrain. I will give some examples afterwards. We are also producing uh, mosaics, global, uh, global and European mosaics of satellite data, so people can access it uh, through web map services. We are producing what we call biogeophysical parameters that are depicting the status of vegetation and the evolution of vegetation and the water, both in its uh, solid and its in, uh, liquid state within the, the, the terrestrial water. We are also monitoring the ground motion so how does the, 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 the ground move due to different uh, um, due to different causes that could be uh, human intervention but could also be natural causes? And then we are also create, we are also in charge of giving access to reference and validation data. At global level, this means that we have, if we go from left to right, first we have the global systematic monitoring. This means for the whole Earth, you have data on uh, related to the status of vegetation, the status of water, and also land cover and land cover change. All these data are created in, uh, in what we call in remote sensing, low spatial resolution, which means about 300 meters per pixel, except for the global land cover that now has moved to 10 meters pixel. We also have uh, ground-based observations for validation that could, can be used in the validation of satellite imagery. And we have the hotspot monitoring. The global component has two different types of hotspot uh, or, or priority area monitoring. We have those that are uh, monitored. This is, we create land cover and land use data uh, due to its interest on biodiversity. And we also have the ones that are due to its interest on agriculture. Most of them are located in Africa and in South America. And as I said, we are also responsible for creating global uh, Sentinel-2 mosaics. 
So these are mosaics of images that cover the whole uh, globe and that are created at 10 meters spatial resolution. While at the European Environment Agency, we have a, a similar but slightly different uh, portfolio. I will not go into details because it's a very wide portfolio and then we would probably run out of time. But in short, you will have what you see here on the upper part is what we call the priority area monitoring. In this case, in Europe, for Europe, we are monitoring urban areas with more than 50,000 um, inhabitants. We are also monitoring riparian and coastal zones due to their uh, importance for biodiversity. And we are also uh, monitoring um, protected areas that are covering the natural 2000 areas. On the, on the part in the middle, you see the pan-European products. These are land cover and land use products that cover the whole EEA 38, the European Economic Area. We have the Corin Land Cover, which is one of our most famous products. Uh, since it is, it has been ongoing. It has been first time it was created was in 1990, and then since 2000, year 2000 has been updated every six years. And we also have the high resolution layers that are uh, that are giving land cover characteristics such as tree cover density. And down in the slide, you can see first the EU Hydro, which is an hydrological network net that we are mapping. We have the European Ground Motion Service. This is the uh, it, this is only available at, at European level. We currently do not have a global level uh, a service as such. It would uh, entail uh, it is it, ha it has a huge volume data volume. And doing it at global level, though it is possible, it would entail a huge effort, but we will see because there are some countries that are really interested in doing it. And then we have the biophysical parameters that, as I said, they are mapping a vegetation status and phenology and the water cycle. All our data sets are quality assessed, they are fully documented, they are freely available, and what is more, we have a long-term commitment to produce them. This is very important because uh, when you consult one of our products, you know that it's going, it has a time series behind that goes in some cases until 2006. But not only that, there is a commitment to, in, to produce these products on the long term. This is why we only produce things uh, products that are on their operational phase. This is that they can be produced reliably and consistently on a time series. Uh, so to make sure that every time one of our products is uptaken, you can trust that it will be maintained even if we could introduce some changes. This is very important and especially at European level since our products are being used to monitor European policies. Our data are available through the portal. They are also available through Wikio. Wikio is a cloud. Uh, and then the access in, through Wikio is a bit different. I put I included all the links so people can check. In the future, it will also be uh, they will also be available through the Copernicus data space ecosystem. But this is unfortunately not available now. This is something that the European Commission is building up now. I can suggest you all, we have uh, a lot of demo sessions and a lot of trainings and a lot of webinars, and all of them are stored in our YouTube channel. I will suggest you, you can, I invite you all to check them, to check our portal, to see what is available there. That we also, we have manuals and we have documentation for all of our products. But what is more interesting is that you can also find demos uh, and trainings that you can attend freely. On what is the planned evolution of the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service? Uh, I will not go into detail on this, but we have some, we, we have different uh, evolution drivers of the service. First, we have the input data. We are dependent on the satellite data. This was, this in the past made us dependent on other, in, 
other uh, space agencies, as it was the case with NASA. Now with the European Space Agency and with the Sentinels, we have um, we have a long term commitment to have this data available. This has allowed us to produce products that are were well not that easily to produce in the past, such as produ products based on SAR or products based on uh, what we call um, full exploitation of time series. This meaning that the, you, you use all images that are available for a given period. And in case of the Sentinels, this is one image per every five days. Another driver of our evolution is the level of automation. We are now going, moving towards higher uh, automation of our products. We are also evolving on the types of our products. We are uh, committed to, uh, document, to documenting everything to a high level of transparency and reproducibility of our product. We are now uh, moving our classification approaches. And of course, we need, we are all the time under the umbrella of the European Commission environment. And of course, some of the de decisions taken by the European Commission impact us. And now I will talk about two specific use cases uh, where we see how were our products used. One is when they, uh, the use of our products for urban planning in Guatemala. They, were, uh, they used information related to vegetation to uh, better plan, uh, better urban planning, preserve rainforests and water sources, also per, per, uh, um, preserve uh, the, the, the biodiversity, ensure forest connectivity between areas, and uh, prevent uh, pre prevention of wildfires and landslides. What they did is they integrated the vegetation change data that we provide with soil topography to guide the field engineers. Another good example of use case is this by the UNESCO, where they used uh, the land cover provided by the global component of the land monitoring service to monitor the impact of a, a hydropower project. You can find all of all our use cases in our web. Uh, I included the link. We have a, we are now in the process of um, of gathering more use cases. Uh, we are trying to encourage people to submit them. There are several of them. You can see uh, the ones that I included in the slide, such as um, how there, there is a, a very nice use case that was published this week on how they are uh, how they are studying the, the, on a study on uh, how the urban heat islands affect vegetation in urban areas. We are also, um, how do we map the coast of Europe or um, how should we manage better the urban green spaces, which are, which are is key in the new, in the European Green Deal. Um, we are also monitoring the, the, the extent of soil sealing, for instance. Um, I invite you all to uh, follow us on LinkedIn for more information and news on on new on on trainings that we will be delivering soon. And with this, I finish a little bit early, uh, earlier than expected. So I will now stop sharing my screen, and I give the floor to Rosny, who will put the video we have like. Thank you very much. Are you able to hear the sound? No, not yet. We can see, but we can't hear. Yes, fine. planet is full of wonders. A tapestry of landscapes, 
each with its own unique heritage. These landscapes are, however, changing. Data derived from satellite observations allow us to understand more. From river deltas to mountain ranges, we can monitor crucial ecosystems. From coastal zones to forested areas, we can better manage our natural resources. The journey to a sustainable future also runs through urban environments where we make informed decisions that will shape our shared future for generations to come. Copernicus Land Monitoring Service. Thank you very much. Um for that uh, very rich presentation and uh, the fact that it's a free service is just incredible. Thank you for that.